startle a lot of people. It's called the Medea Hypothesis. Peter Ward, welcome back to Radio EcoShock. And thanks so much for having me again. Well, your new book picks a fight with a beloved scientist, Sir James Lovelock. Can you explain Lovelock's Gaia Hypothesis, and then we'll get to your answer to it? Yeah, the Gaia Hypothesis is really a wonderfully introspective, I would say, from a both a mental and a psychological point of view, hypothesis about how the world works and how nature works. And introspective in the sense that it has, by itself, entirely spawned what we call new age or new world religions. It really has a sense that the earth is alive and or the earth and its systems act in such a way to better or optimize the planet for life itself. And I gather that it's now split up into two versions that you take on in your book. Yeah, there's always been an extreme fringe, and Lovelock himself is, is really one of the amazing intellects of the 20th century, although for a variety of reasons, I think some of his 21st century ideas are getting increasingly batty, and I'll, I'll go into these in a minute. But it, it also split off into the whole New Age business, which he never advocated. And the most extreme view of Gaia is that the Earth itself, including all the hard stuff that most of the Earth is made up of, is part of a living being, that we are one gigantic living planet with this thin veneer of gas and life itself over this much thicker, rocky planet, but the whole thing's alive. And that, that not even Lovelock himself really advocates that, although in the past he's, he's dabbled in that. The other is that there are many systems, equivalent to, say, our organ systems or our blood system, which maintain life, and that through time um, the whole makes it better for the individual. And I guess that even that branch has split into uh, that which optimizes the planet for life and that which merely regulates the planet uh, somehow using biological means so that life can continue. Yeah, that's really, you've hit it beautifully, actually. That really is the division that goes on. How much is optimization? How much is just letting life continue? I don't think anyone argues with the fact that life influences the planet. It influences geology. It influences the gas of the atmosphere. It has all of these effects on the physical world, and that obviously vice versa, the physical world has effects on biology. That's almost the weakest kind of Gaia hypothesis, is that there is this interaction. No one disputes that. On the other hand, the sense that life itself is making the world better for future life is the other aspect, and that's really where James Lovelock is. It's kind of like you buy a house and or rent a hotel room, if you will, and then while you're there in that hotel, you paint it and clean it up and put in new furniture and spend all this money on it so that the next guest has even a better hotel room. I mean, that's, that's not really what a lot of us think that life is doing here. So, by contrast to that, what is the Medea hypothesis? Well, Medea is the worst Greek mother because Gaia is the name that uh, Lovelock came up with for the good mother, and it was the Greek idea of good mother Earth. And I just almost tongue-in-cheek, but not too much, uh, came up with this idea of Medea. And from Greek literature, we know of Jason and the Golden Fleece. He ran off with King Aetes, who had stolen the fleece, his daughter uh, Medea, married Medea, and Jason, it turns out, was a pretty good captain and a really bad husband. And Medea, in a fit of pique, murdered their children several years later when Jason found himself flirting with other queens. So if you want a bad mother, Medea is probably about the worst, and the sense is not so tongue-in-cheek because of the mass extinctions and other episodes in Earth history. Mother Earth has murdered her children over and over and over again. And I remember in your book, uh, Under a Green Sky, you came to this chunk of rock that looked like about, if I remember correctly, about 10 million years, where there was practically uh, not much alive left in the fossil record, at least. That must be very startling to look at. Oh, absolutely. And those were the seeds that brought Medea, at least in my own mind, to life. Is When you look at these long intervals of time after a mass extinction, it sure doesn't look like life has been optimizing the planet for much of anything. We really go back to a microbial world, and we have a sense that uh, it's, it's not getting better. It's, it's just getting worse. And when life does come back, it's different life. I mean, you can't say better, you can't say worse, but you can certainly say different. 
One of the great things about this book, in my opinion, is your ability to summarize and teach us the latest cutting-edge earth science. There have been some really remarkable discoveries just in the last couple of years. I'd like to get into some of that brain food. But could you start by explaining what you see as a possible flaw in evolution that could end up wrecking our living planet? Well, it's funny you say that. It was one of the first lectures I gave about this. I gave a trial tune-up to my department, which is composed of a lot of really good biologists, and one of the best, a man named Joe Felsenstein, who's a National Academy member uh, evolutionist, sort of raised his hand up and said, well, you know, after you've given this presentation and knowing what I know about life, you're giving way too much uh, chops to this Medea. I think evolution is really kind of a dumb tinkerer and it kind of blunders from place to place. And he suggested that I call it not the Medea hypothesis, but the Mr. Bean hypothesis, that evolution is just this dumb blunderer. And that actually might be a much better sense of what happens, is that there are these evolutionary breakthroughs, and sometimes they're better for the species, more often they're worse, but quite often they have an effect on the entire ecosystem. A new species doesn't care what it does to anything else. It just wants to reproduce, make more of itself. We talk about the selfish gene. Well, I think we really need to talk about the selfish species. Uh, I guess we're a prime example, but also some of the bacteria would take over if they could. Absolutely, and they've been here before. They will be here again. There is a certain finite, a definite finite limit to the age of animal, animals, just that is dictated by the nature of our enlarging sun, by the nature of an aging earth. Um, everything's finite. Well, so too is the age of animals, and the bacteria are laying in wait to take back the planet that advanced animal life took from them 500 billion years ago. Well, I'd also like to imagine a mass extinction caused by a greenhouse effect. I don't think the public has any idea of what that might be like. Can you give us some clues of what happened? Yeah, when I wrote Under a Green Sky, um, I was I tried to put out some op-ed pieces or something about this, and I was sort of viewed as a fringe lunatic, and that, although that may, may definitely still be the case, finally, actually, some people are waking up because of a whole raft of independent studies, both from the past mass extinctions, but what is happening on our planet today. I mean, I, I suggest that a greenhouse extinction just occurs when the planet warms up enough that the poles and the, the tropics are so similar in temperature that it slows down ocean currents. Slowing ocean currents causes the ocean to lose its oxygen. An oxygen-free ocean spawns a group of bacteria that animals don't like. In fact, these bacteria can kill off animals. Well, we're starting to see that right now. We have a warming poles, and the poles are warming radically faster than the tropics. Tropics just can't warm much warmer. The poles can warm up all the way to the temperature of the tropics. And so you have this asymmetry. The asymmetry is causing the heat difference between the polar regions and the equator to drop, and as that drops, there's less impetus for wind and current. As things stagnate, oxygen stops being pumped into the ocean. And there you go. So NASA got hold of this. We were A bunch of us were taken down to NASA Ames at the behest of the director there, saying, look, is this a bunch of nonsense or is it possible? And 15 scientists were invited, and every one of them stood up and said, you know, this is looking pretty bad. In fact, it's looking like it could happen way faster than anybody's suggesting including a slowdown to the point of near cessation of the Pacific gyres starting next century. So it's definitely happening. Well, I thought about you and your theory when I was listening to a lecture, one of the uh, lectures at the Oxford uh, Beyond Four Degrees Climate Conference. It was just held at the end of September, and uh, Professor John Schellenhuber was talking about oxygen-free zones that were developing in the Indian Oceans at key levels where fish would live, and I thought, whoa, I wonder if that's the beginning of this. Well, all this leads to one of the central messages of your book, which I think will confuse some people. For me, I was reading it in the long past and in the long future. The real threat is not increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but dropping levels of CO2. Could you explain that for us? I know. Nature is just full of irony. It's, I think it's the most delicious, but most frustrating of all aspects of the universe, I think. Yeah, the, the, the irony is that over the long period of time, what's going to doom animal life isn't too much CO2, but not enough. It turns out that animals, and this is one of the things I, I point out in the book, is that 
life is taking so much carbon dioxide and putting it in places where it can no longer be recycled that a half billion years from now there will there cannot be more animals on this planet because we're going to lose all plant life and once we lose plant life we'll lose animal life soon after and it's simply before because every time you look at a mountain that's white made of limestone you're looking at a whole lot of carbon that life has taken out of the atmosphere by producing skeletons and then simply deposited in places where it cannot be recycled we are doing just the opposite right now. We're taking carbon out of rock and putting it back in the atmosphere. And that's something in the long term we humans will have to do.